It's very good to see you this morning. Given the fact that the uh, title for our lesson is Mr. Unpopular, you might think the lesson's all about me back in high school. But I want you to have your Bibles open to Psalm or, or Isaiah 53 at this time. And I want to talk a little bit about Jesus and the relationship that he shared with his, uh, his contemporaries. And uh, in a lot of ways, uh, the way that that relationship is seen even today, Jesus was not very popular and continues to be quite unpopular today. And yet, even as he was and is so unpopular with so many people, Jesus was nevertheless and is victorious. Begin in Isaiah 52, actually. I want to go a couple verses back here. Uh, and, you know, and this is one of those unfortunate chapter breaks in the Bible, by the way. Isaiah 53 begins there in verse 1, but really the, the thought has been going on for some time in Isaiah. And I actually like to start back in chapter 52, verse 13, to get a sense of more of the context here. He says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. And you might think, well, those seem like kind of contradictory ideas, don't they? The, the fact that Isaiah obviously inspired by God to say these things, but the fact that Isaiah would say that my servant will prosper, he'll be high, lifted up, and greatly exalted, and then in the very next verse say, and yet he was marred more than any man. How can one be high and exalted and lifted up, and yet maligned and insulted and marred more than any other man? Go to chapter 53 now and pick up here in verse 2. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus was overtly ugly or anything like that. It just means that when you looked at Jesus, there was really nothing about him physically speaking that, that you're drawn to. There's nothing about him physically speaking that you'd point to him and say, kind of like King Saul, like that guy's a, he's a head and shoulders above everybody else. He's a head taller than everybody else around him. He looks the part of being a king. No, Jesus didn't look the part. He just kind of looked like a bland, regular person. Now go on here to verse 3. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from, uh, from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Again, it doesn't sound like he was very popular with the people all around him. You know, sometimes popularity can be based on appearance, that people are popular just because they, they look really good. They look the part of being the popular person. They look the part of the, the alpha male. They look the part of the person walking down the, uh, the, the corridor or the hallway in high school. They look the part of the popular person. And, and that person might not be very likable in actuality, but because they look the part, everybody's kind of drawn to them. Jesus didn't look the part, and thus people were not drawn to him in that physical sense. Go on down to verse 7 now. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave, it says in verse 9, was assigned with wicked men, and yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now go on to the end of the chapter here in verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he, soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. I mean, that's victory right there, isn't it? In spite of everything that the Messiah would experience, in spite of everything, every down moment, Every moment of being distraught and broken and alienated and rejected and alone, victorious in all of it. 
victorious. I will allot him a portion with the great and will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for all of the transgressors. Even though the Messiah is clearly victorious in the end, the prophecies here in the book of Isaiah clearly present him as achieving that victory through alienation. He was not popular and continues to not be very popular today. And as one reads the Gospels, the very stories of, the Jesus, uh, of Jesus' life, especially in the Gospel of John, it becomes very clear that he, repeat, uh, he faced repeated hills and valleys throughout His ministry. Now, there were times where people flocked to Him. There were times where if Jesus had wanted it, He could have had a crown placed upon His head. There was even times where people were practically thrusting royalty upon Him, trying to take Him away by force to make Him their king. And if he had wanted that kind of popularity, it was right there at his fingertips. But for every time that he was seen in that light, for every time that he was almost taken by force to become a king, there were also times where people rejected him. There was a time in his own hometown when he was there in the synagogue, preaching from the prophecies of the Old Testament about himself, and his own homes townman, uh, uh, homes townsman, that might be a made up word. His own homes townsman, but we're going to go with it, tried to take him and throw him off a cliff. Again, that doesn't sound very popular to me. His popularity, the esteem that people had for him, ebbed and it flowed, it waxed and it waned. It was all a product of the fickle nature of the people that surrounded him. Of course, when he fed people, when he healed them, he was beloved by all. But when he condemned their actions or he upset the order of their lives, he was suddenly public enemy number one. Let's look at a couple of examples of this. And I want to focus on the Gospel of John. And there's plenty of other examples in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But as I was studying John recently, just in my own personal Bible study, this really stood out to me. The fact that in John's Gospel in particular, you see within the same chapter, moments where he's just popular and on the top of the heap, and in the same chapter, he's almost trash in people's eyes. Let me give you a few examples of this just to illustrate what I'm talking about. John chapter 6, that's probably where, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you knew, you knew I was going to go to John 6 eventually, right? Go to John chapter 6 and notice a couple things here. And of course, we're going to be skipping around quite a bit because we just don't have time to read all of John chapter 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10. But we'll read a couple verses just to illustrate the point that I'm getting at, where one moment he seems to be Mr. Popular with everybody, and almost a moment later becomes public enemy number one. Notice here in John chapter 6 and verse 15, Jesus therefore perceiving they were intending to come and take him by force to make him a king, withdrew again to the mountains by himself alone. They loved him so much that they wanted him to be their king. They thought, hey, if this guy really is the Messiah, then let's get the ball rolling here on installing the Messiah on his holy throne. And let's get rid of Rome and begin the process of having a kingdom of our own again. Let's make him our king. That's what they wanted. Going down to verse 22. The next day the multitude that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the multitude therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got in the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. They want to know where he was. And when Jesus isn't there, they, they're investigating. Where's Jesus gone? Jesus was feeding us. Jesus has healed us. We really like having Jesus around. This guy is very, very popular. But does Jesus take advantage of the popularity? Does, does he take that popularity and reinvest it somehow? Does he, does he ride the wave of popularity to new heights 
Interestingly enough, here in John chapter 6, Jesus takes the very people who were clamoring to see him and confronts them with a truth that they didn't want to hear. As soon as the multitudes find Jesus, this is his response to them here in verses 26 and 27. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. He calls them out for it. He says, I'm not popular because you believe the power of God is working through me. I'm not popular because you see God working through my works. I'm not popular because you really do believe that I am the Messiah embodied. You're, I'm just popular because I fed you the other day. And you'd like to get fed again. And you want a handout and free food. That's why I'm popular right now. And then he proceeds to spend the rest of the chapter calling them out for that and saying it's not about food, physical food. It's about food, spiritual food. And if you really want to know who God is and be a part of his kingdom, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. <coughs> Did you really just say that, Jesus? E yeah. Eat my flesh and drink my blood? Are you serious about that? And he pushes it and pushes it and pushes it to the point where it says in verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Mr. Popular one moment, practically by himself the next. And we'll look at Peter's response a little bit later in the lesson if we have time. Because I love the way Jesus, uh, or, or Jesus confronts Peter, asks him a question, and Peter just comes back with the, the home run of answers. So if we have time, we'll get back to John 6 a little later in our lesson. Go to chapter 7 now and see another illustration of this. In John chapter 7, notice verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly as it were, but in secret. The Jews therefore were, at, were seeking him at the festival and were saying, where is he? And there was much grumbling among the multitudes. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the multitudes astray. Now skip on down to verse 15. The Jews therefore were marveling, saying, how has this man become learned, having never been educated? I mean, look at the way some people really love him. Some people really don't. Some people are just confused by him. There's mixed messages going around Jerusalem right now about who Jesus is. Verse 20, the multitudes answered, you have a demon who seeks to kill you. Well, hold on a second. Where, where were all those people saying, you know, I, I think he's a good man. I'm, I'm not threatened by this Jesus of Nazareth. I think he's a pretty good man. Where did all those people go all of a sudden? Go down to verse 25. Therefore, some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, Is this not the man whom they're seeking to kill? And look, he's speaking publicly and they're saying nothing. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? However, we know that where, where this man comes from, but wherever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. So there, there's confusion there. They don't understand Jesus. They're back and forth about it. Their opinions are ever shifting about Jesus as they learn new information about him. John chapter 8, notice verse 30. And look at the contrast here between verse 30 and the end of the chapter. I just want to look at two verses here. Look at the contrast. And I, by the way, I see this all as happening in, in one day, one conversation here. This is not separated by a great swath of time. This is one conversation. In verse 30 it says, And as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Okay, many came to believe in him. But by verse 59 it says here, Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. Many came to believe in him. But the very same day, many of them were picking up stones to try and kill him. Wow, that's quite a, quite a stark contrast in public opinion right there. John chapter 10 is the same way. In John chapter 10, notice verse 19. It says, There arose a division among the Jews because of his words, and many of them were saying, He has a demon and he's crazy. 
Why do you even listen to him? But others were saying, These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? Now, uh, can he? Now, at the same time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple. The Jews therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Of course, they don't like his response very much, do they? One moment they seem to be receptive to the message. If you're the Christ, just tell us. Just inform us. And he gives them an answer. And at the end of the answer, in verse 31, the Jews took up stones to stone him. I mean, one moment you're interested and curious and you're asking questions and you seem maybe on the cusp of genuine interest. But when you don't like the answer to the question, you want to pick up stones and throw them. Verse 40, And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. So they went from believing in him and being interested to wanting to kill him. And now there's other people who believe in him again and love him. Ever-shifting public opinion. Now, for sake of time, I'll give you two more examples to study on your own. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. Compare that. Okay? Compare that to John 19 and verse 15. One moment, Jesus is entering Jerusalem like a triumphant general. Like someone returning from a campaign filled with success and glory. It is the triumphal entry and they are crying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Hosanna! Now that's Sunday. But by Friday, what are they saying? Crucify Him, crucify Him. In less than a week, the people of Jerusalem go from crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, to crucify Him, crucify Him. Less than a week, my friends. Now, let, let's start making some applications here. Okay, We've given a number of examples. I want to give some applications. Why did Jesus endure such unpopularity? At any moment, even in His own words, He could have called myriads of angels to His aid. He didn't have to tolerate this. He didn't have to tolerate people trying to throw stones at Him. He didn't have to tolerate people trying to throw him off a cliff. He didn't have to tolerate people talking about him behind his back, whispering about him. He did not have to tolerate that. He didn't have to put up with that. And yet he did. And as Isaiah 53 put it at the beginning of our lesson, like a lamb being led to slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. He just took it. All of the unpopularity, and he just took it. A couple of things to think about. Four points. I think it's four. The reason why he was able to endure so much unpopularity was because he was mission-focused, first and foremost. Mission-focused. And when you are mission-focused then it doesn't matter what public opinion says about your mission. If your mission is the right mission, it doesn't matter what people think about your mission. If it is true, if it is right, if it is a just cause, then it doesn't matter how many people are on board with it. Who cares what public opinion is, or what popularity says, or what the polls are saying? If you are mission-focused and your mission is just, then it doesn't matter what other people have to say about it. And you know, by way of practical application, there are a lot of truly great things that we are asked to do in this life, both by God and out of obligation to the people around us. As parents, as spouses, as servants in a community, as servants in a church, we are asked to do some great and wonderful and amazing things that will not make you popular. Parenting, for example. If your main goal is to be liked by your children, you're doing it wrong. Now, we certainly hope that in the long run, our children love us. 
We certainly hope that after years of investing our time and our energy and our very vitality to raising them and loving them and caring about them and providing for them, that in the long run, the right kind of parenting will produce the right kind of relationship with your child. We hope and pray for that. And we trust the process that's involved in that. But if your main goal is to be your child's buddy, your child's best friend, to be loved and adored by your children every single day and every moment, and I just can't spank him because he would not like that very much. If that's your main goal in parenting, you're doing it wrong. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry, really. You're doing it wrong. Because Ephesians chapter 6 makes it very clear that our mission as parents is to not just be liked and adored by our children. Our mission as parents is to raise them in the fear and discipline of the Lord. Now you add to that Hebrews chapter 12, which is a scripture we're probably familiar with. And in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer makes it clear that all discipline for the moment seems to be very unpleasant. Nobody likes being disciplined by his or her parents. Nobody likes it. At the moment, we don't enjoy it. But the writer goes on to say, in the long run, we respect our parents for it. Because we know that we had earthly fathers who cared about us. We had earthly fathers who disciplined us. We had earthly fathers who wanted what was best for us in the long run. And they will sacrifice the immediate emotional response for the long-term spiritual benefits. Being a parent's not going to make you popular with your kids. Saying, no, we're not having a bowl of ice cream right before bed doesn't make you very popular. Saying no as you're walking through Target or Walmart, walking past the toilet. And by the way, if you can in any way work out your Walmart trip so you don't walk past the toy aisle at all, that's probably your tip of the day, okay? But when you say, no, we're not buying a toy today. Why not? Because we're not buying a toy today. (laughs) I mean, put it back on them and say, well, why should I buy you a toy today? On what basis can you make this demand from me, child? That doesn't make you popular. It doesn't make you popular. But if you're mission focused and your mission is to raise your children in the fear and discipline of the Lord, then you will do what is best for the mission in the long run, not just what is best for some immediate emotional gratification. And Jesus was mission focused always. Next, because truth defined him. The reason why he could endure so much unpopularity was because truth defined him. And truth is exclusive. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And when you are truth-focused, when you care about truth, when you are defined by truth, when you speak truth, then it doesn't matter how many people are on board with that or how popular it is. Truth is always truth, no matter how many people want to believe it. Truth is always truth, no matter how many people want to believe it. And Jesus was defined by truth. And the thing I loved about the ministry of Jesus so much is that he always invited others to change and come to him. He called for adaptation from other people, not the other way around. Now, popularity, earthly popularity, human popularity, more often than not, is based on ingratiating yourself to other people. I want to be popular with people, so I'm going to adapt to them. I'm going to pick up the language of them. I'm going to wear the clothes that match them. I'm going to try and butter people up or earn my way into their good graces somehow or do favors for people. It's all about ingratiating yourself to other people. Jesus didn't make those compromises, though. And he always demanded, you come to me. If you want to be right with me, I'm not going to be the one who does the changing. You come to me. And if people weren't on board with that, then Jesus let them be. 
In John chapter 3, for example, notice the way he puts it here. In John chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, one I'm sure you're very familiar with here. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now notice you're beginning in verse 19. And this is the judgment, that the light is coming to the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. People preferred to do their evil deeds. They were not willing to get rid of their evil deeds. Even if it meant being right with God, they preferred evil. They chose the darkness. They loved the darkness instead of the light. And you notice that God never made a compromise and said, well, what if I hit the dimmer switch and we'll just kind of meet in the middle? Would it be better if I turned the lights down? Is Jesus too bright for you? Is, is the light of Jesus too glaring for your sin-accustomed eyes? Then let me hit the dimmer switch. Why don't I take a couple bulbs out and we'll dim the room? Would that make you feel more comfortable if we dimmed the light of Jesus? No. God never made that compromise. For everyone who does evil hates the light and has not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But verse 21 says, He who practices the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifested as, as having been wrought in God. No compromises there. When you live for truth, that is an uncompromising ideal. And yes, it will make you very unpopular. As a side note here, nobody ever remembers the followers. Right? Nobody ever remembers the cronies. You know, nobody, nobody ever remembers the minions. Nobody remembers the cowards. No, nobody ever remembers the nameless many who blend into the background of a dark and fallen world. Nobody remembers those people. And if your goal is to have earthly popularity, what you're really asking for in earthly popularity, what you are really asking for is to just become another drop in a mud puddle. That's what you're asking for. Earthly popularity is indistinctive. Earthly popularity is not light or bright. Earthly popularity is just joining the rest of the world in its darkness and its ignorance. And because you want to fit in, like I said, all you are then is just another drop in a murky mud puddle. That is earthly popularity. People who are right in God's eyes, though, are the lights of the world and the salt of the earth. They're a city set on a hill and a lamp that never agrees to be covered up by a pot or a basket. And maybe you won't be popular with the world, but you will be right with God. Jesus was able to endure the unpopularity because he wasn't impressed with glory from men. Notice in Jesus' own words in John chapter 5, as he puts it here in John chapter 5 in verse 41, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. If another shall come in his own name, you'll receive him. And I do think that Jesus was being a little snarky with them. If somebody came in his own name, self-glory, right? Self-derived glory. You'd believe in him, right? You'd follow after him. But I don't come with the glory of men. And you won't believe in me. Verse 44, how can you believe? And here's the clincher, my friends. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Now replace the word glory with popularity and I really think we're talking about the same thing, aren't we? How can you truly be committed to God first and foremost if what you really want is popularity with the world? To fit in with everybody else around you. How can you receive the glory from God when the glory of the world is where you're focused. Those two things don't coexist with each other very well. They really, really don't. And the last point is this. Jesus was able to endure unpopularity because he was always focused on discipleship rather than popularity. 
He didn't want people to just like Him and adore Him and fawn over Him. What He wanted was disciples. People who were committed to the cause of the Son of God. Committed to an otherworldly kingdom that exists for spiritual purposes and not for earthly purposes alone. And discipleship is not the same thing as popularity. It's, it really is not. Popularity comes and goes. But commitment, discipleship, has staying power. Discipleship actually means something in the long run. And while popularity feels nice at the moment, we all like to feel popular, don't we? But, but to me, pop, popularity is like, it's like carnival food, is what it is. It's, it's state fair food. Everyone loves going to the state fair. Well, I don't know if everybody loves going to the state fair. I, I will say, there's a large population of people, myself included, I like going to the state fair. There's just something about it. There's something about the lights and, and the animals and the, you know, the cotton candy and, and the hot dog that you know. Like, you know, I, I know that that's like horse tails and pig hooves and stuff. <laughs> like, I know that. I, I know that. I know that. But you know, you, you, don't, you can't live at the state fair because it's an illusion. It, it, it's like the house of mirrors, right? You, you can't survive on a diet of fair food. It, it's an illusion. That's not what real life is supposed to be about. Real life is about commitment to people, commitment to a cause. Real life is about the work that you put in to serving others and serving God. And the fair is not about that. The fair is about being entertained and, and having cotton candy and, and all that sort of thing. The fair is not real life. And I think popularity is the same way. Popularity is the state fair. Everybody's in a good mood and patting each other on the back and winning prizes. Giant stuffed animals. And then you get home and... You got a giant, you got a giant min minion or something, right? And you're like, but what am I supposed to do with a five foot tall stuffed animal? And you realize once you get home back to reality, that I'm not so sure it was worth it. Popularity is not real life. It's not. Discipleship is. Discipleship is. And you'll find true and lasting friendship and disciple. The last scripture I want to look at, just because we're running out of time here, the last scripture is in John chapter 15. Look at the way that Jesus describes this here. And you know, he's not just asking from us like blind obedience or, or, or kind of just a slave master relationship exclusively. Look at what Jesus is asking for here in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And that's not a fleeting, warm, fuzzy feeling kind of love. That's not an earthly popularity kind of love. That is a deep and abiding servant love right there. Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Discipleship will produce deep, lasting, meaningful relationship. Listen to that again. Discipleship will produce deep, lasting, meaningful relationship. When we serve each other, we become our true friends with each other. When we serve God, we become His true friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all things that I've heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, he says in verse 16, but I chose you and appointed you, speaking to his disciples, that you should go and bear fruit. Bear fruit, he says, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. And Notice verse 17. This, is, this I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you're unpopular with the world, I get it, is what Jesus is saying. I know exactly how you feel. When you're alienated, cut off from people, Jesus says, I get it. Nobody knew loneliness better than Jesus. Absolutely alone on the cross. 
Nobody knew loneliness better than Jesus. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. And if you're really popular with worldly people, that's probably a bad sign. That's a bad sign. If you're real popular with worldly type people. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, the world hates you. Yeah. Therefore, the world hates you. Jesus puts it very bluntly, doesn't he? Because friendship with the world and friendship with God are two things that just can't coexist with each other. Jesus knows. Jesus gets it. Now, if you're not a Christian here this morning, you really ought to be. Make your life right with God by coming to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, who calls to us from Mark 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So, whatever spiritual need you have, please let it be known by coming forward as we stand and sing.